This episode is brought to you by Arden Labs Education. Sign up today to learn advanced concepts in Go, Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, and more. Visit ardenlabs.com forward slash education for more information. Welcome to the Arden Labs podcast. Our special guest today is Anna Wickert. Hey, Anna, thank you for joining us today. Yes, thank you for having me today. And where are you talking to us from? I'm talking to you from Germany, um, within a city called Darmstadt, which is in the middle of Germany, close to Frankfurt. Nice, nice. Love Germany. And it's a four, roughly four-hour train ride to Berlin, because that's sometimes a measurement if you talk with Germans. Yeah, okay. Four-hour train ride to the center of the country from, from Berlin, I guess, moving, moving center. All right, that's, that's cool. Uh, yeah, that gives us a good idea. I love Germany. I, but to be honest with you, I haven't really been outside of Berlin, and I, and I want to. Because everybody says, you know, Berlin's not Germany. Berlin is Berlin. And, and you don't get a, is that true? Like Berlin's really not Germany? Yes, I think that Germany definitely has many nice other cities as well. Rory, you wouldn't also say that New York is the US? Well, I, I, I think I, you could say that like New York City doesn't represent the entire state of New York, right? So yeah, okay. I, I mean, I get it, I get it, I get it. Okay. Tell everybody what you're up to right now. What are you What are you doing right now? What has Anna been busy with? So um, currently I'm doing my PhD um, in computer science or software engineering with a bit of focus on security. And um, one of the things I'm doing in my main, uh, free time, while we, I also know you, is being inv involved in the Go community. So for example, I organize the user chapter here in Frankfurt. Nice. Oh, so you're running the, the user, the Go user meetup in Frankfurt. And nice. Yes, I do. And what is your, your PhDs in computer science? Is it, and um, you're specializing on the security side? I'm currently specializing on, um, so APIs, you can misuse them. And for like normal APIs that may cause like crashes. And for security, it can also cause vulnerabilities. If you use, for example, a very common example is in Java, when you want to encrypt something with IIS, the insecure block mode ECB is used. You may know this um, Linux penguin image, which is translated into kind of the same image if you use ECB. And that's kind, kind of famous, this image. And I'm looking into this problem a bit for crypto misuses and also now also a bit into um, misuses with respect to security for the usage of the unsafe API in Go. Security scares me. Anything related to security, just because you, you have such a big responsibility to, to kind of get that right, that um, I, I always just, Maybe I'm lazy there, but I'm always like, let me push the security on somebody else. It's too much responsibility for me. <laughs> yeah, I totally get it. And I totally understand that as well. Um, when I sometimes meet the cryptographers at my university, I'm also sitting there. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> a lot to take in. Let me take a breath um, to, to also digest everything what you are telling and how this applies to the world. I mean, they're doing theoretical stuff mostly and what's happening outside in practice is a whole different story, at least sometimes. All right. All right. Perfect. And then when are you expected to be finished with your PhD? Are you close to having that done? Um, I hope so. so um, yeah, I hope so by beginning mid of Next year. Next year. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So I want to kind of turn the clock a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about uh, where this interest in computer science and especially security kind of got started. And my first question to you is I want you, just your first memory that pops in your head 
when you remember working on a computer? What's that first memory of working on a computer? Most fascinating and kind of cool because also the computer or our first computer was um, one of the first investments I made because my family back then didn't have a computer. And when I went to commune, um, you usually get money in Germany. I also grew up in a small village where a lot of folks are Catholic. And then I buy right, myself or our family computer back then. And that was actually kind of cool, I think. How old were you? How, how old were you when, you when you bought that computer? I think nine, nine, nine ten. When you go to commune, it's third grade. Now the family, I mean, you didn't buy the computer, like the family bought the computer or you had saved enough money to buy a computer in third grade? Oh, okay. Yeah, because, because of this communion thing. So it's like a Catholic thing where you say that you want to major your beliefs and um, then everyone get you, you get money. Like in a lot of letters, um, you have money inside and you should buy something or use it or save it up. And um, then my dad convinced me that buying a computer is a good thing. It wasn't probably a very fancy computer, but it was a computer. Um, you did pretty good for your communion. Huh? You must have you must have gotten made like a thousand dollars or something like probably probably. Uh, I what what year is this? What year is this when you're when you're nine years old and third, or you say third grade? Twenty one, and I was nine. Oh, you were nine. Okay, okay, right, 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 right. Okay, okay. So that's amazing. So what was what was like the first thing you did with this computer once you bought it? I, I mean, I guess you, you you had an idea of what a computer was. So what was your plan once you bought this computer with all that money that you you uh, you were, you know, gifted. That's a good one. Um, so I think actually learning something new, um, but also, yeah, at the beginning, my, my dad had some ideas what what could do with the computer. And at the beginning, it wasn't even standing in my room. Um, and so everyone was using it. And yeah, I, I think I started using the internet some basic stuff, um, but nothing was development at this point um, of age. No, no, but I find it interesting. So your, your dad kind of convinced you to buy this computer with your money. You bought the computer with your money, but it ended up really not being your computer <laughs> because you, you had to put it out there for the family. To, was your dad like technical or fascinated? with the computer. I feel like your dad like had a big win here getting you to buy this computer. <laughs> no, he wasn't actually very technical, um, like in profession. So he is really good or not really good. He's, I think I do okay with all the tech stuff. Um, and he do a lot of handcraftsman stuff, but tech, he wasn't really into it. Um, but he, he, he saw the potential of it, at least. He knew it was an important tool. You're not learning computers in school at this point. You had computer class? Oh, no, no, you weren't, you weren't. Right, so this, is, was, this was gonna be your, your big exposure. Um, how many siblings did you have? You had to compete for time on your computer? It was one, <laughs> a younger one. Um, I have a younger brother. Like he's one and a half year younger than me. So, yeah, we had to compete compete sometimes, like we were fighting a lot, to be honest. Um, yeah. I, I don't but understand. Actually, he was more on the TV than on the computer, luckily. You never had one of these moments where you're like, that's mine. Get off. This is my computer. Definitely. <laughs> there were some phase. And um, at some point, I got the computer in my room, but just an excuse um, course that my um, parents bought another one. So I got the old one <laughs> in, my, uh, in my room. Um, yeah, but that was pretty great. So it worked until I left home for studying. For, for university. So that was that machine was running, I guess, Windows at the time then? Yes. Um, 
before you uh, before we get to kind of like university and studies um, what other interests did you have throughout kind of grade school was it like what other things were you interested in was the computer consuming your time or it was just kind of a hobby yes so i started also um getting into web development a bit not really deep but um at some point i saw like, like these website generators where they create your website where you just have to enter some stuff and you have these what you see is what you get it does and i was annoyed by the little possibilities and I thought like I can do better and um, so st I started with a uh, kind of programming I think PHP and a bit of JavaScript back then. Um, How old were you when you started trying to write this PHP website? Are we talking like 15? 12, wow. 13, 14 12, 13. around this age I think. What was on this website? At 12, 13 years old, what, what was your website about? Don't know anymore. I really <laughs> don't know anymore. I know that I played around with this cruel JavaScript animations where like snowflakes and stuff are all over your screen. And where I think you should be punished for <laughs> um, But it was cool to see and all this um, graphics, which were kind of cool. And then you had dial-up internet at the time, or your town had, because you said you were in a small town. Did you, did you end up having hardwired internet in the house, or was it dial-up? How were you accessing the internet? I think first it wasn't hardwired. It was like um, via the telephone wire. Yeah. And okay. later we got a bit better um, internet access, but it was slow. So it was really slow. I remember. Um, Shortly before I graduated from high school, made my abitur in Germany, um, we moved into another house. And there, when my mother played online games, I had basically no internet on my computer. <laughs> I was always really annoyed because gaming and TeamSpeak or something didn't work very, very well then. So your mom was the gamer in the house. Oh, look at that. No, not, re no, not really. <laughs> she, has, she has just um, some logic puzzles and um, she enjoys doing them like as break, um, as a break. And there are a lot of them online, just kind of game, has some flash in it, consumes internet, annoys your daughter. <laughs> no, but she didn't do that to um, annoy me. So talk to me about high school then. Um, what what grade is it when you graduate high school in Germany? Is it like you're 17 in 12th grade or is it, are you younger? Um, it's older. So um, I got my degree with 19. So we had to drive to school or we'd be able to drive to school by car um, for the last, I think for me, it was roughly one year. Okay, at 19. And at this point, you're starting to think about, I guess, university, right? At that point, at 19, you're finishing like your high school there. What are you thinking about in terms of, of that university education? Is it a computer degree? Is it like, what is it, business? Is it something else? Um, I actually knew that three or three and a half years before already um, because you can um, finish school at around 10th grade in Germany for all the um, education on the job. So if you don't want to go to university after the 10th grade, is enough for the German system. And um, I knew that I wanted to make something with computers and development back then already, and decided to go in this direction, but to continue my degree at school. Um, yeah, then I visited a lot of different opportunities to know about training on job, different um, subjects for university courses and stuff to know what I want to do. And you could have gone to the job market doing computers after 10th grade, right? You decided you wanted to get the higher level education. Yeah, my mother motivated me to do so because my grades were good. And she stopped after 10th grade because she wanted to earn money. 
and she said that was something which closed her, her some doors, doors later on. And she said, take the two and a half year longer and then you can do more or less everything you want um, without having to retake um, your high school degree. So it sounded like she had some regret not, not doing those last two years and jumping into just earning money. What, did, what, is, what was your mom, was your mom working at the time that she's giving you that advice in 10th grade? What, what, is, she, what is she doing? She was at this time um, selling stuff at markets um, after she um, was learned for, not waitress, but, but hotel management, like all the service stuff, also on a very good hotel. But she stopped when um, I was born because it wasn't compatible, compatible with family life. And then after my brother was born, she didn't go back into the good restaurants, hotels, um, because there weren't any clothes. Um, and then the um, restaurant where she worked in our city, our village was closed. And then she looked for alternatives and did you have a bunch of universities that you could choose from, or was there just one that you knew you wanted to go to at the time and that got you out of the house or you stayed in the house? Like, talk about that. So I wanted to go out of my parents' home. Um, that was something I knew 100%. And um, actually, I had a bunch of options because um, I could go basically to every, not every, but I think most of German universities and applied universities. And we had like a big green book from our working office. And there were like, I think six pages or something like this with universities or applied universities, which offer um, information technologies or related um, studies. And I went through all of them and looked at them, <laughs> which I want or which I like or which I didn't like. And how many did you apply to? Actually, um, one. Just one. So you go through this big book, rating everything, like you, you do this whole rating system and it comes down to just one university that you apply to. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, um, it happened that um, a good friend of mine back then also wanted to study the same subject. And then we looked a bit together and this one was the university or applied university as my bachelor, which we both liked. Um, what, what was it about this one? What was it about this program? It wasn't that the school was really far away from home, right? It was... <laughs> um, it's a bit more simple. I wanted to go back or away from home as soon as possible. And um, we have some different states in Germany. And my state had the idea that you finish your degree in March and not like all others in the summer. And so I had to search for universities where I can start in the summer term. Spoiler, I start in the winter term in the end <laughs> because of regulations. Um, but in theory, I could have started there in March or like while doing my final oral exam, I would have already went to university oh so you had you had a logistics issue between finishing your high school and starting university and so you you couldn't start in march you had to start in the summer but so, i wanted to start and so i filled that all of the universities out that i couldn't start and in my state they had to provide me the opportunity in theory that i could start and so a lot of universities were filtered out by this criteria. So how far away was this university from, from home? Were you like three hours away? Or is it closer? Um, 100 kilometers. It was like a train ride from around one hour, depending on where I went, um, and roughly one hour by car. So it's like the first time you're really living living on your own. You got a dorm room? Is that did it work that way? They gave you a dorm room. You had a, your meal planned. Did, did you have to work to make some money while you're going to school? Yeah, I had a shared apartment. My first one was actually with, I think, 
11 or 12 others. So it was really big. Um, wait, wait, time out, time out, time out. This was a school apartment or something like private. off campus, private. Of, you had off room? campus. This is like a small hostel. Are you, you're, you're living with 12 people? In the house, we're living two others, uh, 12 others students. So everyone had their own room. So I had a room for my own, but okay. only house like 11 or 12 other students were living. All right. So it was like a more of a, like an apartment sort of dorm, or was it like, like a home house house? It was like a house house. Oh. It's like with a kitchen, with a very nice um, outside area with, I think, two garages um, for parking. And... Did you know the other 11 people before you moved in there? Actually, some of them, yes. Um, I went with, um, to visit the apartment and then I met a few of them and I liked them back then. And Back then. She liked them back then. <laughs> yes. Um, no, actually, most of them, I still like them, but we don't have contact anymore. Um, and I actually visited them once during our event. They've organized some barbecue or something like this. And they said, yeah, do you want to join before you finally sign the contract? Uh, then I went once there and had that's a like. A, that's a lot of people to be living with. I mean... That, that's a lot of people to be living with. Was it, I'm sure it was cool for the first few weeks or, I mean, I, how long did you stay in that house? Did you stay in that house for the four years? No, I stayed in the house for one year um, because it was also too loud sometimes. And I got a really, really great offer also directly at the campus by a friend of a friend, <laughs> uh, which was only slightly more expensive, like, 120 euros more, I think. And I thought that's doable. And I also don't have to commute to campus anymore. And so I went for this one small flat, which I had for my own, which was really boring compared to the other. Yeah, you went from one extreme to the next. You went from like communal living where everybody's basically on top of each other, even if, even if you can escape into your room to being completely on your own. Were you were you working to be able to pay rent or that was covered by, by um, I guess, whatever money you were getting from the state? Yeah, so like, um, because my parents didn't earn that much, um, I was able to get a student loan from the government, BAFRIC, and I had that. And I also worked a bit um, next to it in a, really cool project at um, my university to bringing um, kids or uh, girls into mint uh, STEM subjects and um, jobs. So the university paid you to do that sort of STEM work. What, what was that work all about? What, what was your responsibility there? Did you have to visit local schools? Yes, we actually did sometimes um, at local schools. We had one partner school back then and I was there where we um, teach them to um, program a uh, Lego Mindstorm. So we were a group of a few students and we teach them interchangeable. So there was one week that I was teaching with another one and another week two other uh, women were teaching them how to program on Mindstorms. That's kind of a cool job. Uh, that That's a really nice, how did you land that job? Uh, it was just available? Um, yes, basically. No, um, but it was from a project which is called Ada Loveless um, project. And I myself visited some of the workshops um, which were closer to my hometown. I also developed something on Lego Mindstone back then. And then at this university, because it's in the same state, um, they had the same project. And on the information day, they had like a booth there. And I went there and asked them what they're doing and stuff like this. And then they were like, yeah, if you want, you can also become a mentee or we can contract you to do also the great work. Um, that's, that's, wow, that's a great job. Definitely, so it's awesome. When you, start, you started your 
when you started university, what was you, you were going to get a, a degree in like information systems? Was that is that the degree you ended up getting, or did anything kind of change in the four years you're at university in terms of what you wanted to learn? Um, no, it was three years for the bachelor, and back then, um, and nothing changed. So I made this degree straightforward. What was what was the majority of your those three years? Was it was there a lot of programming involved in that? What what was the what did you like your core primary? What did you learn in that undergraduate degree? Um, a lot of programming because I was at an applied university, and some of our professors also said like, if you leave here, you can develop and you know some development basics. So we did a lot of Java. Um, it was always like theory in the lecture and we had to do practical assignments all term long and sometimes in teams and sometimes on our own um, against the clock and stuff like this. Um, we also did some really cool stuff about databases. So how to query databases, how to optimize them a bit. That was really cool. And I learned that something which can make life really easier is having a group of folks who want to achieve the same as you and also to be able to transfer knowledge. So you had you had really strong study groups of people where you were helping each other. Yeah, I was really lucky. We are still in contact, at least most of us. What year did you did you finish that that uh, first degree? What year was it when you finished that undergraduate degree? It was 2011. I went to the university and I finished my bachelor's in 2014. Okay, 2011 and 2014. So, so in 2014, you have your degree finished. You have an applied computer science degree. You got a lot of strong programming knowledge. You've, you've done what your mom asked you to do, which was to kind of push that education a little farther. So now it's it. This is it, 2014. You're ready to jump into the job market, right? You're ready to start making the big bucks. Yeah, I decided to do master. <laughs> no, Bill, I decided to stay in school. Why, why that decision to stay in school? What was it that you, what were you look? what was, what were you thinking? Like, you just loved being in school and you just wanted to continue that? It was, I think, mostly learning more at this point. And um, that for some jobs in Germany, um, we had a diploma before it was called with a bachelor and master together. And some position give you much less money if you just come there with a bachelor. Because I say bachelor is like no real degree. It's not a real university degree. And I heard that some, from some others. Um, and there, therefore I decided, okay, now I'm into learning. Now I'm into this thing. Let's finish it completely. Wait, wait, wait. Who was who was saying that this undergraduate degree that you just got wasn't a real degree? I, I, that bothers me. That somebody is saying that this three years of education you got wasn't real education. It wasn't um, as accepted as the diploma, which was five years. So okay. it was like not counted always. So for example, if you want to work um, for the government or for the states, um, it's not counting as much. Um, and you get like thousands of euros less um, per year without the master degree. Um, but I also knew friends who started their job with the bachelor, but also most of um, them, uh, most of the boys in my study group also take the masters afterwards. So you decided just, no, I'm gonna go hedge down, I'm gonna get these last two years, I'm gonna get my master's degree. What did you decide the degree you wanted to do, I guess something in computer science again? So it, it all started with my bachelor thesis because um, at my university, we didn't have like um, profs telling you, um, here are topics, you can choose one of them. At least for the one where I wanted to write, it was like, you have to choose your topic by yourself. And um, I considered or considered once um, a topic about also how energy consumption for programs, stuff like this, um, and a bit of security and testing. And everyone less, or folks I talked with, 
um, told me, yeah, like the inner environmental stuff and energy consumption, that's not a thing. Better do the other one. And so Actually, I ended okay, up. Okay, okay. All right, time out, time out. It time was out, 2014. I, I, I know. All right, it's 2014. I want to know where the energy consumption of compute kind of gets into your head because how important of a topic is that today? Anna, you were like, you're like almost eight to 10 years, you're a decade ahead of everybody because you're thinking about environmental impact on compute in, in 2014. And I, that's not a thing, get, get that out of it. Like, where did that idea even come from in 2014? I think um, because I know also a lot of folks studying environmental stuff because there was um, the department at my university. And so I heard them talking about a lot of env environmental stuff and also about how to separate your bin and all this basic stuff. And I asked myself, what's with our computers? And um, my dad also, um, he bought me to at my from my 18th birthday, I didn't get a car, but I get a laptop. And he told me, use this, the energy consumption is less than <laughs> like from the big computer. And so I never got another big computer and I'm using always laptops back since my 18th birthday. Um, and so I think it was a combination of both that my dad made me aware that computers consumes differently energy and... Um, but you got pushed away from that, I guess. Okay, so you got pushed away from that and you got kind of pushed into the security side. Where? Where does the interest in the security come from? Um, I did an internship before my studies in um, testing, which was basically back then at the company, you write a test plan, which was also fun. And then you test it by yourself. So there was in 2011 and 2012, no automation in this company, but I liked it and also I like the testing stuff. And I asked myself, what can I do further with ensuring or improving quality of programs? And then I ended up, okay, security maybe. I also was interested in the cryptography lecture at my university, and but that was only open for masters. And so I said, okay, I have a bachelor thesis coming up. Um, you can dig a bit into this topic during your bachelor thesis. So, okay, so now in 2014, you got to do two more years. And after all that, you decide that you're going to focus on security and you have to choose the specific topic. So what specifically then was your master's degree kind of focused on as relates to security? Um, it was, it's called IT security, which was offered in Darmstadt. So I moved again further away from home. Um, now it's like roughly two hours car drive. Um, oh, you couldn't, uh, you didn't do your master's in that. You had to pick another university to do your master's in. Did you go through the same process and go through the entire book and then just apply to one university? <laughs> I'm teasing you a little bit, but. <laughs> I, I was like, yeah, security. And then I looked um, which universities have a master degree which specializes a bit on uh, security or has courses on security and that were far less universities and um, then back to my bachelor's. Gotcha. But you picked this, why did you pick this particular university for your master's then? Um, because it was um, focused also more on application security. There were some um, lectures about static analysis and some of the software part because there were like um, a few programs which focused more on networks and hardware and that wasn't in my interest. Yeah, I think that was the main motivation because I say, yeah, the program sounds interesting. Okay, so and you... they had the possibility to row there, so you could go rowing via the university sports, and that was also a plus. Okay, so this is the first time I'm hearing about you being a rower. Were you doing any rowing at all prior to that? Um, no, I started a bit rowing in my um, bachelor's. And currently I'm also not rowing anymore, but back then I really enjoyed rowing. 
Uh, you got to talk about that for a second. So you're, 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 when you're doing your undergraduate and you're on campus for the first time, you saw the rowing team out there and you're like, I want to do that? Yeah, I had um, friends via the apartment where I lived or house where I lived the, for the, my first year. And there were some folks or friends of them um, rowing. And they said, yeah, come with us rowing. And so I started to go with them. And um, I mean, it's also actually nice. Rowing is, I think, a cool sport. Um, and having a beer and a barbecue afterwards is also, I think, really cool. Did, did you ever see the movie Oxford Blues with Rob Lowe? Because all I can think of is you have to be up at like five in the morning and that's not, that's like not my wheelhouse. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it, it is really relaxed. As I went to Darmstadt, I realized that my technique, which I learned in Bingen, was like not good at all. And it was more like Fox having fun doing a bit of sports. Um, so it was not at all like competitive, competitive or elitaire or something like this. But it was okay. really relaxed. Okay, okay. But when you when you did the rowing uh, in the school that you did your um, masters in, was it still like, like we call it recreational? You were still just doing recreational sort of rowing. It wasn't competitive. Um, there were a bit more competitive and that was also some of these things which took me a bit of the joy because I mean, it was hard at least for me um, with several side hustles to go there three times or two times a week especially as my city is not close to river and you have to take a bike ride from one hour per way to go rowing <laughs> And then, yeah, I stopped it during my um, PhD when I also went bordering. Um, and then I suddenly said, no, it's, it's too much of a commitment. And I don't want the others to depend on me um, and my rowing team because rowing is a team sport. And I said, I, I can't give what they're expecting from me. And it doesn't make sense if I go once a week when all others are training more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you must have been in amazing shape. You got to get on a bike, ride to the river, get in the boat, row, then you got to ride your bike back. <clears throat> I'm exhausted just thinking about it. Sometimes you took the car, to be honest. So it was not always bike, but car was also like 30, 30, 30 to 40 minutes car ride. Yeah, that's a commitment to, that, that's a commitment right there. All right, so when you, you, you do your two years, you, you, you get this master's in, in kind of, you know, application level security. You're learning, I, I'm, I'm guessing what you're learning is, at least in this master's degree, is how to better, how to write software in a way where it mitigates all of these sort of, like, memory buffer overflows and, 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 and things like that. Is there more to the, what more to the degree are you learning there with application security? So um, it was general IT security. So you had different focus areas. What I learned more or what I enjoyed more was several lectures on static analysis, how they work, because there's a whole field on research about all this stuff. Um, I took several courses. We also had some um, basics like cryptography. I was at a course, for example, about post-quantum cryptography. You had a lot of different stuff. And I also could take some software engineering courses um, from their bachelor degree, which I also took chance of. For example, I um, took a testing course again, which was kind of similar to my course in the bachelor's, but very different because it was my university and not that applied. Did you get to write any any like static analysis tooling during that degree? Mm, yes, we had, for example, in practical labs where we had to write some. And um, I was in a research project where I was kind of the only developer for static analysis for Go. That's why I went into Go. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so that's, was that your initial, um, how did you discover Go? Was it during that, during those two years, during your master's degree, that that language popped up on your radar screen? How did that happen? 
yeah, that happened this way. So I wanted to have um, a job again because also living in the city was more expensive. And um, I thought like getting more experience is always good. And then I saw like different announcement from one in, a, in one lecture and I talked with the professor and he had like this task with Go and I looked up Go and I thought like, yeah, sounds cool. Also the research project was kind of cool. Um, and so I learned Go and went a bit into Go. That's exciting to think that at the university level, at least the professors had Go on their radar screen and with all. So to build the tooling you were doing for Go, were you using that AST package? Were you, are you using a lot of that? Yeah. Yes, I did. Um, it was back in 2015 and 2016. Um, I think it's still marked as experimental, but I was always like hoping <laughs> that it, it doesn't change. Um, so when you finish the next two years, now you've got Go experience, you got more experience with application level security, uh, static code analysis. This is all really cool stuff. What do you decide at the end? You decide, no, I still am not ready to jump into the job market yet. There's more to learn, and that's when, in, say, 2016, you jump into your PhD? It was 2017, um, okay. because my master took a bit longer. I had to work more, and I also went um, one for six months abroad. But that um, made some taking some courses a bit more difficult. Um, but yeah, back in 2017, I looked for different options. I also um, had interviews at companies and look what they have to offer um, to see what I can do. And um, somehow I was interested in the topic I um, was offered at my current position. And I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. I want to dig into this. Um, yeah, so and I ended up doing a PhD and not leaving out, uh, leaving. So you didn't you didn't take a full time job while you're doing your PhD. You, you decided to just stay heads down. But you said you, you right right. You said you interviewed at a few companies prior to making the PhD decision. What were those? What were those jobs you were interviewing for? That they, they didn't. None of it interested you, in terms of working. Definitely, some of them interested me. The other one interested me more. At least at this point, I was kind of. Also, I know friends also told me that it was sparking more joy or more enthusiasm after talking about this one interview I had with my current supervisor, followed the feeling at this point. To just pursue more education instead of going into the... So you were interviewing as a PhD candidate at the same time you were interviewing at, at companies? Yeah, why not? Yeah, no, no, no. Did... did so the PhD that you're a year out, right, from finishing, is it at the same school that you did your master's degree in? Yes, it is. So it was also no moving, but also the jobs I interviewed for wouldn't have um, been involved moving. So it was all I looked for in the region I'm currently living in. Talk to me about I've never, I, I am impressed with anybody who has a PhD. My sister has one in microbiology. I couldn't even read the title of her paper. I couldn't even pronunciate the words. Forget about reading. Like, she sent it to me. I couldn't even get past the first page. Like, it's super impressive when someone's able to kind of dedicate that amount of time, energy, and knowledge and, and do that. So, and you've been doing it now for like about five years, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of super interested in what's involved in getting this PhD. Is it like the first couple of years, pure research and writing? And like, can you kind of walk me through a little bit of like what the last five years have been like getting this, this PhD and the, and the work that you have to do to, to earn it? Yes, I am. So like there exist different programs. And for me, for example, at the beginning, it was that I have to know everything about the project I'm working on for a big review with um, our agency, which gives us the money. And that was 
kind of intimidating on my first days as I get to know it. Um, and so that was basically my first two and a half months, knowing everything about the project, making posters and preparing myself to answer questions about the whole project. What was the, pro what was the project itself? What was the, the core project that you were jumping into? It was a collaborative or is a collaborative research center where a lot of different disciplines and a lot of cryptographers are working on. And we are providing a bit of support from the software engineering perspective. Yeah, basically they are observed or others observed that um, developers tend to make often misuses um, for cryptography. Sometimes they are on purpose, but sometimes also not. And one of the reasons was that or is that there is a knowledge gap and we try to provide static analysis and code generation to bit closing this gap between developers and cryptographers. These, these cryptographic algorithms are like beyond my brain. I, 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 I mean, they're complicated algorithms, aren't they? I mean, and you, you've got to do static code analysis against like heavy duty mathematical equations, right? No, we do them against the APIs mm. providing functionality. So we don't test the implementation, but um, we test for misuses of the API. Um, so that's okay. a much simpler, simpler job to do. So your, your first two months is completely trying to become completely knowledgeable on the project and, and what's required and what needs to be done. And then after that, you, you, do you just pick certain things that you're going to focus on over the next few years to help the group? Yeah, so I knew that was like the topic I should do. And then I started reading other papers, thinking about ideas, how one can solve the aim we had back then. Um, and then there's at some point um, supervising students is something I did freak, uh, a lot in my first two years, I think, um, with CSS. And um, then in 2019, I submitted my first short paper I created a benchmark and then I tried to build a bit up on it, but I also worked on other projects. Um, and now I'm, I'm trying to get all the things I did um, a bit together to, to wrap it up and to finish. Into a final sort of final paper and, and a final sort of like piece of work. Yes, yeah. Just submitted two papers last week. So you're spending a, a lot of time writing, like, like, right? I mean, you're spending a tremendous... Would you say like the majority of your time is spent writing at this point f to finish this up? No, currently not. Um, also, sometimes for me, writing also includes getting my data straight. And um, that's... I, can, I think you would say that our ponder is coding as well. But um, yeah, but it's also a bit of reading. So you also have to read, um, read up, read papers. Um, but yeah, the writing will increase over the next months for me, definitely. Wow. Are you, what are you doing to earn money while you're doing this as well? You must be working a little bit part time. Yeah, so in Germany, we are really lucky and paid. Um, a 100 position for doing our PhD. Oh, it's you're getting, in a sense, paid for doing the PhD work. So you have enough to cover expenses. Yes, I have definitely. That's huge. Wow, that's that. Yeah, that's brilliant. So that that alleviates a lot of stress. Yeah, I definitely. So, w okay. So you're gonna be done with your PhD in let's say like a year, right? Like that's the plan. It's gonna happen. I'm looking at Anna if you're not on the YouTube and she's like, I can see it in her, in her face. Like, it's going to be, we're almost done. We're almost at the finish line. <laughs> and then we're done with schooling for a while, Anna. So you're going to, you're going to jump into the job market. You must be thinking a little bit about what you want to do. Are you thinking government? Are you thinking 
like uh, private industry? Do you have a general idea of what you, like the Go team has openings right now for people to work on the, the crypto side of things. Like the Go team needs you right now, Anna. They need you right now. Would that be something you're interested in? Would you go work on the Go team and help with the, the crypto related um, packages? I, actually, I don't know them, um, so I can't say a clear yes or no, because I think um, the team and the concrete task are really important. Um, back to your question, I think I want to go um, private and not work for the government, um, because there are also, I think, one or two close by, and no, I currently don't think that I will work for them. Um, I have some ideas. I'm currently exploring what they are not or thinking about, but they are not like final or something. You know what I mean? Like no, I do, but I I, I want to know what your dream job is. Like if you if you the the moment you get that PhD and you hang it on the wall, like what's that dream job you want to do on Monday? Like what what's what would that that job be? Probably taking a bit of time off. <laughs> <laughs> My dream job is to go to go on vacation. Okay, okay, I, I get it. <laughs> okay, uh, three months after you put the you put your PhD on the wall, and now we're saying, Doctor Doctor Anna, you've done your three months. You you've relaxed. Okay, you've been drinking, you know, tropical drinks on the beach in Miami because you know you have to go to Miami. Uh, What's that dream job? Good one. See, and in general, I would like to work further on things to improve stuff for for developers because I think it's actually something really cool which we can do because I learned a lot of specialized knowledge, even though there are folks which still know more hundred stuff more and are more experts, but I think I still know a bit of a lot on it. Um, and this topic and I think it's really nice to to help in this degree um that QA job that you got back when you were doing your undergraduate work right that's when you had that that QA job made this massive impact on you I I, I, I want to explore that just a little bit because you come out of that testing job with this notion that um, you want to improve software, like you want to improve developers' lives, but you also want to improve software. Like, even just now, what's the best job? My best job would be to help improve the quality of, uh, like, this testing job had this massive impact. So I'm wondering, did you just see nightmares of, like, software when you were there testing, or did you just feel satisfaction when you found problems and you were fixing it I, I need to know what happened in that QA testing job no it was actually really fun um, because we saw that there are a lot of bugs um, but to be fair we also found a lot of bugs which were in the software for like 10 years and nobody was bothered about them isn't a 10 year old bug now a feature like when does a bug become a feature, right? Like, you can't fix it at some point. But also something which really fascinated me about this job was um, the big responsibility I got really early. Like, there was one um, man who wrote all the test plans and he used or talked early on with me to, to check on them or ask me also to write a few to support him. And like thinking structurally about what can we test, what can we check for, that's something I really enjoyed back then. Um, and that was also really cool. I was there for one month in 2012, so one year later, and he was off one day. And on this one day off, I was responsible to coordinate all the tests for him, like do you do this task and asking, did you do it and collecting the feedback and writing the test on that what was happening I, there in the small company? That work resonated with you from, from the beginning. Yeah, I enjoyed it, actually. Um, it was also the most diverse team I ever worked in. 
So um, there we didn't have any minority issue. We worked like roughly half women, half men. Um, and I think that was also really cool back there in this job because I never had any job in the IT where we had like a diverse, really diverse team. Um, well, so let me let me ask you a question. If you're still working with Go, they just introduced uh, native fuzzing into the language. Have you ever played with, and it doesn't have to be Go fuzzing specifically, but have you ever played with fuzzing? What are, what are your thoughts on on uh, fuzzing as it relates to kind of the work you're interested in? So I played with fuzzing. Um, I must admit, not yet with Go, but it's definitely on my to-do list. Um, and I think it's a great thing um, in addition. So I think there doesn't exist one solution to solve our problems. And I think fuzzing is one cool tool beside others. Um, and from what I have seen so far, the Go fuzzing tool is also pretty good. Yeah, I played, I haven't played with the new implementation. I, I used to even teach the old implementation. My problem was always that it seemed to work best with functions that took really raw input, like a slice of bytes or something, right? Because the tool is generating a bunch of different random byte patterns, right? Based on a, a starting point, obviously. So if you were, if you had APIs that really couldn't kind of conform to the fuzzing input, it they, it didn't seem to be practical to me. Now, this was me looking at it at a high level. So I, I you know, I'm guessing that somebody knows better than I do about how to leverage it for APIs that are not just say a slice of bytes. Yeah, probably, but I have to be honest, I can't answer you that because I didn't look into detail in the Go feather. Um, you know that there's also a lot of research about it, around it. Um, no, 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 it's all good. It's all good because you're, you, I mean, you did a lot of work in, 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 in testing API, right? An API surface and, and things like that. So I was just kind of curious what your approaches are I kind of, if I gave you a, an API right now on, on something I'd written, like what is your initial approach in kind of validating some basic security? And so basically what most of the problems are is in Java, for example, that the APIs in, um, allows cryptography, but isn't considered a secure anymore. So for example, um, the ECB mode I mentioned at the beginning, that would be something we look for like, it's, it, is it possible with this API to encode, um, uh, decrypt something with ECB? And I would look systematically um, through some of the misuse types be encoded for other languages. So actually I did something with pipe, Python and there it transported or had a list of misuses we wanted to check for where other researchers looked for C and Java. And I took this list and we looked for the different or for four or five different Python libraries um, if these cases are possible. So it's mostly parametric. So which parameters are allowed? Uh, for example, clearing a password or some function calls could be missing. Uh, I got it. Yeah. But I, I like that you're focused on the, the crypto side of things because the entire world is kind of moving pretty heavily into cryptographic audit trails, whether it's blockchain or, or anything else, right? These uh, these algorithms are becoming more and more and more, and nobody understands them underneath. Everybody kind of knows how to use them. I know how to use private and public keys. I, I know how to write, you know, signatures or APIs, but you start asking me about an ECDSA curve, and uh, I'm raising the white flag, like, I, I don't know. I mean, that, that math is beyond my, beyond my brain. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's good, good to be focusing, focusing on that because I, I think this, this is becoming, becoming more and more, and more important, important uh, every, every year. year. Yeah, so we found some problems because security evolves. So things we now add to the API may be not secure anymore later on. And actually one thing, cool thing about and Go, talking about the ECB mode, there, there are blog posts by, I think Rob Pike, don't uh, take my work for 100%. We said, no, we don't include it into the um, standard API because it's insecure. 
it don't need it and that's something i found really cool actually um all right we are pretty much out of time this has been uh for me this has been great because we've we've talked here and there um and i really did want to kind of get your story and i'm really excited to see uh where you land once you get this phd done next year right next year it's going to be done and then it will be really cool to kind of see where where you end up so um, we got to stay in touch so i can i can see that and the work you're doing uh, on the go meetup is what have you have you gone back just just real quick have you been able to kind of go back and start any sort of meetups there are you thinking so everything still has to be virtual there in, in Germany, or can you start doing some uh, like physical meetups again? Um, we can do in theory, um, but we are currently struggling or uh, considering what the best option um, because we also usually get hosted by companies. And so they have to check if they can host us. Um, and we as the OGA team think that currently the regulations on meeting in person are rather not strict in Germany. And so we are looking also for what's, what is like a setting where we all would feel safe to um, make the meetup. And yeah, there we are shaking about. We also hope that we can do some in June or July back in person. Um, but we also had virtual once or only virtual once in March. And you're going to be at GopherCon EU in July. I will be speaking at GopherCon EU. Ah, what is your what is your talk on? What, what is your uh, talk? Um, I will talk about the um, taint analysis um, from Go uh, from Google Google GoFlow Lee. It's a taint analysis um, which exists now for Go, and I. We'll talk a bit about it um, because it's really related to my master's thesis. And I talked once with Angelica for talk ideas. And um, then we both thought, oh, that's actually a cool, nice idea because that's also maybe um, a big intimidating topic if you don't know the basics and don't know what's important because there are only a few books which are approachable or where you don't need a degree or know all the papers about this stuff. Well, if you need a practice audience to practice before getting on stage, reach out because at Arden, we always have like, we always do these, we bring people in to give talks. And I'd like to, I, I believe that at Arden here at least, we're very warm and welcoming and, and we can, we'd love to hear that talk and, and give you some feedback. If you want it, we're there. So just, just remember. Yes, thank you. I will remember it. Yeah, and I'm going to be there too, so I'm going to get to see your talk live. This is, I'm excited. Yeah, <laughs> I'm also excited to go to Berlin after I think it was four years not in Berlin. Um, yeah, I'm also really looking forward. It's my second in-person Go conference. And my first Go conference where I speak in person, not like, you know, virtual for a camera. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah. I'm a bit excited about it. Yeah, it's going to be great. I can't wait. I can't wait. Okay. We are out of time. So, Anna, if anybody wants to reach out to you after hearing your story, what is the best way for them to uh, get in touch with you? I think it's Twitter or LinkedIn. All right, perfect. So we will add that to the show notes when, when this is available so anybody can reach out. Uh, thank you so much. I know how busy you are, so thank you for finding some time to talk to us today. I, I, I really do appreciate it. Yes, thank you too. I think you're also very busy, or I know it. Um, so it, it was really nice to be here. Right. So this is Bill Kennedy and Anna Wicket saying goodbye and hope to see everybody again real soon. <laughs>